Hi, everybody. My name is Adam Pick, and I'd like to welcome you to the webinar titled The Eight Must Know Tips for Heart Valve Patients on this very special day, which is the National Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day. If I have yet to meet you, I am the patient who started heartvalvesurgery.com 17 years ago in 2006. And the mission of our website is very simple. We want to educate and empower patients just like you. And this webinar, which has had over 1,500 registrations from patients in countries all over the world, was designed to support that very important mission. Now, throughout the webinar, you're going to be in what's known as listen-only mode, but I encourage you to submit your questions in the control panel that's on your screen. I'll explain why as we look at the agenda. We're going to have some introductions, then we're going to ask and answer the question, why have a valve disease day? Our experts are going to share eight tips with you. We're going to get into an interactive Q&A session. Then we're going to lead into a set of closing remarks in which we'll talk about the heartvalvesurgery.com patient giveaway. And then I'm going to ask you to complete a very quick five-question survey. Now, to get started, I'd like to share that our sponsor for today is Medtronic. And if you don't know, Medtronic is one of the world's largest medical device companies. And specific to valvular disease, they released their first heart valve in 1977 and have been innovating ever since then. As you may know, they specialize with a minimally invasive transcatheter aortic valve replacement, which has been implanted in over 500,000 patients. And when it comes to heart valve day or valve disease day, I can tell you that Medtronic is all for it. Not only have they made these great cookies, which I got to taste when I was at their headquarters in Minneapolis and we were talking about today, but they really are focused on driving awareness and helping people understand that it's so important about the lifetime management of heart valve disease. And we're gonna talk all about that today. So thank you, Medtronic. Now, when it comes to our expert panel, I'm gonna share with you that growing up, I read a good amount of comic books. And uh, I would submit to you that we have a fantastic four with us today. We have Dr. Heather Johnson, who is, the, who is a preventive cardiologist. Dr. Johnson, thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it, Adam. Yeah, we have Dr. Mustafa Ahmed, who's an interventional cardiologist. Hi, Dr. Ahmed. Hi, uh, looking forward to this, thank you. We have Natalie Kelly, who is a valve program coordinator. Thanks for being with us, Natalie. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. And we have Dr. Gregory Fontana, who is a cardiac surgeon. Dr. Fontana, thanks for being here. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure. Yeah, so let's get started with a very big question, which is why have a valve disease day? And I'd like to start with the commonality of valve disease because about 2.5% of the U.S. population has valve disease. I don't know about you, but on my street alone, my neighbor to the left had an aortic valve and aneurysm procedure, and my other neighbor, Kitty Corner, had a mitral valve repair and coronary artery bypass graft. This disease is all over the place. Over 10 million people in the United States. So a big point I want to make there is that you're not alone. The other thing I want to share is that the disease typically skews up in age. So 13% of people who have the disease are age 75 or older. But as you know, I'm a patient and I had the disease go to a severe level when I was 33 years old. So I needed surgery much younger than the norm. Um, sad fact, 75% of Americans know little to nothing about heart valve disease. And that gets even worse when you realize when it comes to treatment, this is a very undertreated disease with less than 40% of people getting treatment in particular for severe aortic stenosis. When you wrap all that up, 
the moniker for heart valve disease is often the silent killer. And according to estimates, about 25,000 people will lose their lives due to this disease. So why have a valve disease day? I think it's very apparent. We need to drive awareness to this big, big health burden. And so what happened? Well, we started Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day back in 2017. We've got over 100 organizations that participated. It's recognized by the US Department of Health and Human Services. And when it comes to statistics, we're doing some good. We've had over a billion impressions and reached nearly 166 million people. So we know why we're here, we know what we're doing, and to level set everything before we talk to the experts, just wanna make sure everybody is aware there are four valves in your heart. The aortic valve, the pulmonary valve, the mitral, and the tricuspid. And if they don't work properly, that can lead to a lot of debilitating symptoms. And as we've already talked about, some very sad situations for friends and family. So you're not alone in the situation. Heart teams are designed to help you. And today we have an, several great members of a heart team, but you can see here, it's not just one doctor along the way that should be helping you. Really wanna find the time to associate and establish with a true heart team that specializes in heart valve disease whether it's the general cardiologist, a preventive cardiologist we're gonna hear from today, an interventional cardiologist, the valve clinic coordinator and cardiac surgeons, just to name a few. So to get started, we're gonna turn it over to Dr. Heather Johnson, who, as I mentioned, is a preventive cardiologist. She is, a Chris, she is the Christine E. Lynn Women's Health and Wellness Institute. That's where she's at. She's an associate professor at the Atlantic University and she is based out of the Boca Raton Regional Hospital and is part of Baptist Health South Florida. Dr. Johnson, thanks for being with us and please proceed. Thank you, Adam. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation to participate. So really briefly, I know before we started officially, we were chatting and Adam was asking about preventive cardiology. I'm also in that special figure you just saw as far as general cardiologist, that's my big hat. And so many things I do within that. And we talk about prevention and we'll talk about some of those in a little bit, but as your general cardiologist in relationship to valve, you know, you saw the figure about having imaging as far as connecting you, as far as the special valve clinics, interventional cardiologists, surgeons. I work also very closely, usually with the primary team, as far as helping you and your primary team understand your diagnosis about valve disease, walk through that journey, and then if needed, move you on as far as the next step, as far as what should be done about it. And we're going to talk about some of those things in just a little bit as we move forward. So next slide, please. So I have to say that I have two key tips that I will highlight. And the first one is that heart valve disease diagnosis, any of them can be confusing. I do recognize that. And it's one of those things in which I want to highlight as far as why it's important that as you walk through this journey, you have various people to help you understand it and have the best quality and healthy life moving forward. Next slide. So we're gonna start as far as really broadly, as far as two key types of what we call heart valve disease or heart valve conditions, big, big picture. Adam has already highlighted the various four types of valves that we have, however, when we talk about what types of disease, again, there are variations to this, but there are two key types. Number one has to do with the term stenosis. One of the most common is aortic valve stenosis. So we see the leaflets in the picture here and they look kind of thickened and they become stiff. And what happens is that literally it's narrowing of your valve. And as the size or the orifices or that opening gets smaller, imagine your heart trying to push that blood through the valve. So naturally, if it's a smaller opening, the heart is working harder. So that is what we call stenosis or narrowing. Big picture, aortic valve stenosis is one of the, the, the most common forms of this. Now we're gonna click again and then talk about the second big type, 
And that's the term regurgitation. Now, you may have heard people say, I have a leaky valve. So that's a term you may hear and know the blood's not leaking out of the heart. I wanted to clarify that because I've had some people ask me that. But the term regurgitation has to do with the leaflets of the valve, the heart squeezes and the leaflets come together. There's a space between those leaflets. And so instead of all the blood moving forward, some of the blood comes backwards through the heart. So imagine the heart having to work a bit over time because it's trying to push the blood floor forward, but because of the separation, it leaks backwards. So when it pushes the blood forward again, it has a little bit more work to do of getting all the rest of that blood forward here. So it's called a leaky valve. The blood goes backwards through the heart. It doesn't all goes backwards. There's different amounts that go backward and it does eventually go forward. But the key thing is that the heart is working harder. It's doing extra work. You see in the picture, you see those yellow arrows as far as the smaller ones in that top chamber. And that's one of the things, imagine eventually over time, sometimes parts of the heart get larger because it's trying to accommodate some of that blood going backwards, a little bit more blood. For both of these, your team may mention that you hear a heart murmur. Sometimes your primary care physician or primary care clinician could be one of the first people that say, hmm, I hear a heart murmur or at other times. I want to take the time and highlight is that when we first learn about a murmur, it doesn't mean that we have a dangerous condition at that moment. Heart murmurs are a sound. It's a sound that we hear and it can be from other things, not just from the valve. So I try to make a point to explain to a patient if I hear a murmur, explain that it is a sound that I'm hearing and I will tell them if I believe it's coming from the valve. We talk about kind of narrowing regurgitation stenosis and we'll talk about moving forward. Now, next slide, please. When we talk about the valve itself, I want people to understand that when we first assess the valve, we're trying to help you understand, is the condition more mild, moderate, or severe? Because we may see the regurgitation, see the stenosis, hear certain things on exam, it doesn't mean that you have a severe disease. And it could be that some valves can have sort of natural sort of regurgitation or leakage, it's there. There are different terms we may use in the medical field. Many people for decades can have mild, trivial, trace, other forms when we talk about, for example, regurgitation or leakage. But we need to know that when we talk about disease of the valve, true stenosis, narrowings, regurgitation, where we're seeing changes of the valve, changes in that how much is going backwards. That's what we mean about a progressive disease. Now, we're gonna talk about the importance of listening to your body. But because these valves may have narrowing or regurgitation does not necessarily mean you're going to have symptoms. And so that's why we talk about the importance of having your heart checked. The other thing as we chatted about a little bit before this started is that sometimes there are other heart conditions related to having heart valve disease. So for example, for the aortic valve is one of the main valves and it's connected to the actual aorta, which is the main artery coming off the heart. There can be enlargement or dilation, or you may know the term aneurysm in relationship to it. We also know that the heart has electrical system running through it, these fine fibers, and there can be electrical situations such as atrial fibrillation or different heart rhythms that can take place either by itself or in relationship to valve conditions. And that we also know that heart disease and valve disease can sometimes go together. Adam just shared as far as in his neighborhood, someone having a valve procedure and also having to have what we call bypass surgery or heart artery as far as in relationship to disease. So it's one of those things in which when we see valve changes, we also look for other possible heart conditions. The good news about all of this is that although true heart valve disease does represent structural changes, changes in the way the valve is functioning, changes in the challenges of the flow through the heart, it is definitely something that can be monitored, 
treat it to definitely try and maintain quality of life. Next slide. So big tip number two is listen to your body. Many times, be it my general cardiology hat, even preventive cardiology hat, people want to know what's going on with their heart. Next slide. And I say that we as individuals, we all present very differently. When we focus on heart valve disease, sometimes when the symptoms begin, we may not know what's going on, or even if it's the valve. This slide provides an overview of some symptoms. So I, you know, we talk about chest pain, but I actually like to use the term chest discomfort. Some people talk about flutterings or skippings and they're beaten. Broadly, we call those palpitations, dizziness, lightheadedness, passing out, or people may say close to passing out, just feeling fatigued, winded, ankle swelling. An individual presented to me solely with ankle swelling. In fact, his wife noticed it, and sure enough, he had valve disease. It's not to say that if you have these symptoms, you have a significant valve disease, so we think broadly. But if you see on the other side of the slide here, the American Heart Association has what's called the Heart Valve Disease Symptom Tracker. And it allows you to be able to check off or kind of remind yourself what you might have been noticing. And it's available uh, at the American Heart Association's website. And so again, they talk about the shortness of breath, difficulty sleeping, having to sit up while sleeping, things we may not even realize we should discuss when we're having our heart checked or just talk with our doctors about. The other thing is that we may notice people may slow down a little bit. And so you're not doing the same activity. So when we ask about, why well, are you having any symptoms? You say, no, I'll sometimes ask, well, what are you doing? And if you tell me you've slowed down, we dig a little deeper as to why. Next slide. So this allows us to be able to see and be able to evaluate, is it your valve? Is it something other than your valve? Do we need to look for arteries, look for rhythm issues, think about heart failure, all of those factors. Thank you, Adam, go ahead and we can move on to the next bullet point. But the key thing about it is that in addition to history and discussion and us talking back and forth about how you're doing, and we compare how you're doing to how you were previously doing, we then determine what's the next best step as far as various tests that may be needed for your specific presentation. Next slide. So I want to highlight that there are many different tests that are available. And it's not one size fits all. It's not that every person receive all of the same tests that we have available. Some of the more common things that we tend to start with is an ultrasound of the heart. You may also know the term echocardiogram or echo for short. And in our figure, we see the gentleman laying down and we call that a probe on the chest and taking pictures. And we're able to see all the different heart valves, how they're functioning, how the heart is squeezing. Also look and see as far as signs of heart failure or damage to the heart. And it's one of those, the basic tests we may use. Now there are different types of ultrasounds and we have three dimensional and we have the kind in which we look over the chest. And sometimes people are even sedated for what's called a transesophageal echocardiogram, where the probe goes down the throat and we're able to look much closer at the valve. Don't worry, you're, you're sedated, you're sleeping. The other more common test right away we tend to do is an electrocardiogram, for short, either EKG or ECG. And that's the pink figure you see where we're checking the rhythm, what's going on. How's the heart rate? Is it too fast? Is it too slow? Is the rhythm changing at times? Sometimes you're asked to even wear a monitor for a bit of time for us to be able to see what's going on. So I always clarify because sometimes there's confusion of echo versus EKG. So when I'm asking what you had done, I always ask, did you have the jelly on the chest? That's the echo, the ultrasound. So we sometimes do CAT scans, MRIs, and various tests that are available. So just remember the team's goal is to determine what's best for you. Next slide. The last point that I wanna highlight is that when we talk about heart valve disease, that there can be decades or years and the timeline definitely varies as far as progression of the valve over time. Many people, when they first learn about true valve disease, something that we have to monitor, and we'll talk about 
how often to monitor based upon what condition we see, what degree it is, mild, moderate, severe. There can be quite a bit of time as far as before you have any symptoms. But we want to highlight that especially when those symptoms develop in relationship to valve disease, that is an important moment. Understandably, people are not excited when we mention the need of needing to have some valve procedure. But we're doing it because of the fact that we know that especially when those symptoms develop, it is super critical to try and actually help save your life, preserve your quality of life as much as possible. So there may be sudden symptoms as far as shortness of breath, passing out, heart failure symptoms. And unfortunately, we know that there's limited time as far as, you know, really much more serious events after that. So I always say, make sure you have timely follow-up. If there's mild findings, your doctor may say, we may not need another ultrasound until at least a year or later. Sometimes they want it yearly, less than yearly, different types of imaging. So stay in touch with your team. We try and move sooner and not just wait for symptoms. The valve as far as how, what we do has definitely changed over time, but understanding listening to your body and allowing the team to be able to get you to the right place in a timely manner is critical to preserve the quality of life and help provide all possible options to you. Next slide. And I'll turn it over now, thank you. Great, thanks, Dr. Johnson. And now we're gonna have Natalie, who is uh, a valve program coordinator, coordinator at Christ US Trinity Mother Francis Health System. She is also an intensive care nurse. And thanks for being with us, Natalie. Thank you, Adam. And thank you, Dr. Johnson, for those two great tips. My name is Natalie Kelly, and I'm a registered nurse and the valve program coordinator. A little bit of background about my role on the heart team is that I get to provide comprehensive seamless care from that initial referral all the way through long-term follow-up for our valve patients. I often uh, get the opportunity to go between surgeons, cardiologists, patients, and many other disciplines. I think that the most gratifying aspect of my role is just that program ownership and being able to serve our patients through that personal communication um, with our heart team, the patients themselves, and also their families. So, Thank you again. I'll have you go to the next slide. My first tip for you is to get educated and get involved. Next slide. It's certainly normal to have fear and even some apprehension prior to meeting with your heart team, but I think that understanding the steps of your diagnosis and what options that you have for treatment is so important. It's also important to be an active participant in your care, and it starts with doing some homework. So research your care provider team, learn what options are available to you, and really don't assume that all heart teams are the same. This might include techniques, number of procedures, skill sets, and capabilities. But I'll also encourage you not to dive too deeply into the internet. Start with some reputable sources for your information. Certainly being on heartvalvesurgery.com is a great place to start. You can also consider looking at CardioSmart and HeartHub. Next slide. And as you're doing your homework, doing your research, getting prepared to meet the heart team, I would encourage you to make a list of questions that you want to ask your heart team. Physically write them down and bring them with you. Bring a support person to the appointment with you. This is someone who's going to be there for you, who's going to listen, and who's going to support you. And think about communication during the appointment. I want to encourage you to be engaged. Clearly communicate with your provider team. Again, writing those questions down is so important. Make notes of the points that you want to cover to ensure that those important questions and information, um, your questions get answered by the team. And also just know that this is a two-way discussion. Don't be afraid to ask tough questions. Don't write off your symptoms as a sign of aging. Uh, be engaged in that discussion. But also remember that before making any decisions, it can take time to process information, and ultimately you are in the driver's seat, and it's okay to take time to weigh those options before you make any final decision. But in doing so, I would also encourage you to set goals with your heart team. Think about those personal goals. Define where you want to be after the procedure and what you might hope to gain through going through with the whole process and the operation. Is it enhancing your quality of life? 
keeping up with your children, keeping up with your grandchildren, continuing to work and do your hobbies. It may look different for everyone. And that's where the personal touch of the heart team comes into play. But managing your expectations going into surgery can really allow you to have that successful recovery. Next slide. And I want to take a deeper dive into questions from my favorite educational tool for heart patients, and it's called My AS Journey. This resource is directed toward patients with aortic valve stenosis, but the questions that I'm going to cover and list come from this tool. They really do apply in any type of scenario with the heart team. And I included a, a little link down there at the bottom if that's a resource that you want to check out. But let's talk through some of these questions. Why is treatment necessary? Next. How effective are my treatment options? Next. How do I know the best treatment for me? What are the risks associated with the treatment options? Am I a candidate for a less invasive procedure? And so, oh, and will the treatment of my valve disease impact my life? How is treatment going to impact my life? And really from a patient perspective, um, being well prepared and having these questions um, ensures a more effective and informative discussion with the heart team. Next slide. And that brings me to my next tip. We spent a little time on um, before you meet with the heart team. Well, what about after? When the procedure is already concluded, you're ready to get back to your life. What's another tip for you? And that is keep routine follow-up with your cardiologist after your valve procedure. Next slide. So after your surgery, regardless of the procedure, you are going to leave the hospital and have those scheduled follow-up appointments. A lot of times if you have open heart surgery, you may have a one or two week post-operative visit followed by a six to eight week follow-up with the surgeon. And then for TAVR and those less invasive procedures, you often have a one-week phone call or visit, followed by a 30-day follow-up with an echo, and then a subsequent one-year follow-up with an echo. So a lot of times those short-term annual appointments, you're going to walk out of the hospital and that's planned for you. But what happens after that, now that you're through surgery, things are clear to resume normal activities, you're back to your normal life. I would encourage you, no matter what type of valve procedure that you had to address your valve, to see a cardiologist on an annual basis. What is that going to do for you? It's going to allow you to continue to meet with an expert. Your cardiologist will be able to conduct a physical exam, listen to your heart, and also address any issues or concerns that you may have. It gives the cardiologist and you, the patient, the opportunity to recognize and address any issues promptly. Eventually, your cardiologist may recommend an echocardiogram to check the strength of your heart and the function of your valve. And really, it's those annual visits that allow your doctor to look out for those trends and monitor your heart valve. It truly is an essential and ongoing part of care for heart surgery. Um, it's definitely going to extend those benefits of surgery. We talked a little bit about before about defining those goals and expectations. Well, these are those goals and expectations served out or through the annual follow-up. And my last point would be that keeping that follow-up is going to enhance your quality of life. Great. Thanks, Thank you. Natalie. Those are some incredible tips. And I wish you could talk to every single patient who goes through a heart valve procedure because it would take so much anxiety, fear out of the process because you just laid out how to manage your expectations through everything. So thank you so much. And I loved how you're empowering patients. Uh, moving on to Dr. Ahmed. He is an interventional cardiologist at UAB Medicine. He's also an associate professor. He's been featured in over 90 medical publications and his specialty is transcatheter valve therapy at UAB Medicine in Alabama. Dr. Ahmed, thanks for being here. Sure, thank you. So um, nice to talk to you all today. So I'm something called a structural heart specialist, and it's a it involves a interventional cardiology. And what that really means is if you go 10 years ago, just 15 years ago, when I went into the field, it was one option. You have valve disease. There's very few valve specialists back then. 
and you go for an operation maybe and then about 15 years ago and over time what's happened is so many there are so many options now many done by traditional surgery many done by minimally invasive and then many done by this thing called transcatheter which means how do we maybe go through a vein or go through an artery in a in a manner that can maybe treat those people when we started this field that were felt too high risk to have any type of surgery but now through a very very kind of wonderful processes and technology and teams such as that assembled here today talking to you and everyone involved um, we now have a whole array of options and really work closely with um, this thing called a heart team and the, the interventional cardiologist and the structural heart specialist, really mainly how do you go through a catheter and do that and, and evaluate this disease. So let's start with the slides next. So the most important thing to get across, and when you have valve disease and you're told, okay, your aortic valve is tight or your mitral valve is leaky or whichever valve it may be of the four, no no normal person, and this is for, for everyone on here, no normal person wants to hear, go and get your chest cracked open and have an operation because they've read about maybe some option where, hey, my my one of my friends or my parent, they went through the leg and they fixed that valve and they went home the next day and they did great. And the reason this is such a critical tip is whenever going to get evaluated for valve disease, the key is to understand all the options, really look across everything and see what the best option for each individual case is and be open-minded. And, and what does that mean? I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So let's go to the next slide. So, so two things here. Um, on the left is an aortic valve replacement. It is, we'll show you a little video of that in a while, where a procedure through the leg called a TAVA procedure has, or TAVI if you're in Europe, um, you've gone through the leg and you, it, you know, within 20 minutes, put this heart valve in, um, expanded it into place, you're kind of lightly asleep. And before you know it, the procedure's finished, if all goes well, and later in the day you get up and you're walking around and you have a uh, discharge the next day, you follow up and that, that's the whole experience. And, and that's a way of replacing a valve. And on the right, you have a band and a repair of what's a mitral valve surgery, um, which is for a leaky mitral valve, this repair. and But that involves a surgical approach, and that might be, we'll talk in a minute, but that might be with a robot surgeon, or it might be through an open heart surgery, or it might go through the leg, and there's options called a mitral clip. But each treatment has very different advantages and disadvantages. A TAVA procedure might be great if you are looking at a way that lasts a long time we'll talk about this in a minute too lifetime management but if you have at the same time disease of your arteries and you have at the same time disease of their aorta and those things are there but they're not kind of critical yet but they're, they're getting on towards that it is actually much more complicated to go and put a valve in like this and then do some stents in the arteries or maybe not teach them or treat them or maybe go ahead and watch that aorta over time and if you said to someone hey we're going to replace that valve um, it can be done quickly and you go home and that's all there is that's fine but in many circumstances it is better to do an open heart operation put some stents let's put some uh, bypasses instead of stents and replace that valve and set up another procedure down the road nicely and also repair that aorta. And what you don't want to do is go for a treatment which sounds absolutely brilliant compared to the other one for instant instantaneous purposes, but then in one, two, three, four, five, 10, 20 years, undergo a plethora of treatments which become more and more complex and actually limit the treatment options available after that. Same with the mitral valve. You can go through the leg and maybe put a clip on the valve and do a repair. At the same time, if you are high risk and you are not the best surgical candidate, great. We have data on that going a few years and it can be done. But then we have mitral valve repair. Yes, the recovery is a little bit longer, 
But then we have people and data and studies looking at people over 30 years. And you have to ask yourself, when you go and speak to a physician or you go and speak to a provider and you're like, hey, what, what are my options? Never go in. My biggest point of this tip is never go in and say, hey, I want the most minimally invasive thing possible. That absolutely should be in your mind. It would be on my mind as well if I was going in and getting this done. But really what you're asking is, what is the best treatment for me in the totality of all the conditions I have that not just takes into account my experience when going in, but really builds a management plan that takes into account all of the other things I may have. If you have an aortic valve and you're having a replacement and your aorta is large, that needs to be discussed beforehand. Or if you've got a lot of arteries and people putting a stent, that needs to be discussed. And if you seem like you're having a mitral valve treatment and someone's offering you a mitral clip, is the surgeon that you saw at the same time experienced? And do they understand that? And really all of this is discussed by a good functioning heart team. The best way to approach this tip of be open-minded is to say, okay, I'm going to go to a team that has all of these options available. Everyone in these teams is actually pretty good at these options. They've discussed not just the most minimally evasive option, but the other options too. And then take all that together and come up with a decision that leaves you in an advantageous point, both instantaneously and in the future. And listen, I've had people come to me and they're 60 years old and they're demanding a valve through the leg and their reason, they understand. They understand you may have to go in and it may you know, lasts long, but it may not last as long. And going back in in 20, 30 years may be different. And they understand they may need to have a surgery down the line. However, after all that, they are making that decision. And someone might say to me, listen, I'm in, in flying right now. And I'm in these few years and I don't, I can't have surgery now. And this is why, and I a million percent understand. And that's all we want for everyone. We want absolute understanding, shared decision-making, not just go in, someone can do it through my leg. I want to get it done great, you go home, because then, you, then you've got these problems afterwards. So let's go rush through a couple of slides here. So here's some different approaches that are surgical, but I'm going to kind of rush to the next slide too. And let's show this valve, because I do want you to see these options that can be done of a valve. So this is what we do now most commonly to replace an aortic valve. You'll see there's the heart and it's beating, and there's the aortic valve, which we're going to zoom in on now. And there it is. It's kind of opening and closing. You can see that and the big aorta coming in. Now we're looking on top of that valve. And see, there's calcium buildup on the valve, the most common cause of why that valve becomes tight. And in these procedures where we now do this TAVR procedure, we are going to kind of come back. And that red pipe there, which has now become kind of highlighted, there's the arteries. And we can now go through those arteries with something that is as big as a pen, kind of a, a, in terms of profile. We go through the leg and up to the heart. And we mainly, mainly through the leg here, can put us an, a valve through here. We will thread it up through the body. I really wish it was as easy as this video is making it look. I mean, it is quite straightforward, but definitely we don't just, it doesn't just uh, go like this, but there you go. So the valves now come through and you can see it being expanded into place. And we have a chance with the Medtronic valve here to recapture and reposition this and really put it in perfect place. And there you see a new valve and it will be released. And, you know, the actual valve deployment itself when you're in, once you're in there, may take another minute longer than this. And we take out the system in the wire and you have this new valve. And that's called a transcatheter valve. So we'll jump to the next slide. So, and we'll keep going because I don't want to, I've kind of been through a bit of this before, keep going. And the TAVA procedure, which we just showed you, when we first started that for patients at super high risk, we used to say, okay, this may last five years and this may last, a few years and we were using it for people that really couldn't have an operation and some of the data coming out and here's the Medtronic data from the Evolute valve is showing not just at one year, two years, three years, four years, uh, not only is it really matching outcomes seen from a traditional surgical approach sometimes, assuming this is the best option, but we actually have data going out five, six, seven towards 10 years and we're telling patients this is lasting probably as long as the surgical valve you would have had before. And there's further options beyond that. And so let's quickly go to the next few slides. Adam, keep me on uh, time. How long do I? 
Oh, you're doing great. Maybe another two, two, two minutes. Okay. So let's move on here. And, and the final thing I want to leave you with is a lifetime management plan. So whenever you do a procedure, and this is germane to the whole decision-making process and the first point, if you do go in, and I want you to use the example that you're 50 years old, you know, if you're 80, 90 years old and independent, doing well, and we put a valve in you, we care about your quality of life. We want you to do well. And yes, there are options when you become 95 or 100. And 80-year-olds laugh when I tell them that. But I have met so many people back after 10 years of but that the valve was put in 10 years ago that are now asking for the next option. We are absolutely not laughing about that. We genuinely are thinking, what is the next option for our 80 year old? And when you talk about lifetime management, I want you to imagine you a 50 year old. A 50 year old comes in and you are replacing their aortic valve. And when you replace that, they say, Hey, I definitely am not having surgery. I, I want to have a tavern because I want to go home the next day. And I've heard the valve works really well and everyone's having it and I want that now. What goes to our head? What goes to our head is, okay, 50 years old now. When I bring them back and let's assume this last 10 years, they're going to be 60. And then at 60, they may say the same thing again and maybe I can get one more valve inside there. But if I put one in at 60, we're not going to put three most likely of these Tavra valves in. You're then going to be 75 years old and you're going to be facing a surgery that's slightly high risk at that time. But say you had done a TAVR at the age of 50, and then when you were, or, or let's say 60, but you had a, you know, you come back at the age of 65, 70, and we do a surgical valve. We then have one to two more options of valves to put back in. And so when you do those procedures up front, we have to think about what will we do next? If you're 50, the average life expectancy for someone with a bowel disease, you're going 76 years old here for men and 81 to women. You're then thinking, okay, that's then with the technology that was used for this. What if that increases and becomes 85? We do have to make a plan next time. And the TAVA valve may be harder to take out with surgery and the outcomes may not be as good. And so you want to go to a team and you want to take into account, what are my lifetime management options? open-minded approach, and do ask the question, what is my next option? If this fails, what am I going to do next? What is the risk of going to do next? And is a small upfront risk in any treatment plan now taken account later on? And here's just an example of the complexities that we're thinking about. Do we go in? Do we put a valve in? Do we reoperate after that? Do we put another valve in after that? What kind of valve do we put in? Should we do through the legs? Should we take a valve out and then do a surgery and then put a... it? It's complex and your team should kind of manage this with you, but do go in when you have valve disease managed and no matter how minimally invasive it seems, ask what is my next option? How does this weigh up against an open option? And would there be an advantage to a minimal invasive approach over a surgical? But also ask, is there an advantage? And Dr. Fantana is going to talk now. Is there an advantage to a surgical approach over a minimal invasive approach and take all that into account, then make sensible decisions while well informed? All right, thank you. Great, great points, Dr. Ahmed, especially the parts about being open minded. I talk to so many patients when they call me or they email me, they're locked in before they've even seen a cardiologist or a surgeon as to they only want a robotic or they only want a TAVR. So I really appreciate you suggesting the open-mindedness and the lifetime management of valve disease. Moving on to, so thank you, Dr. Mubi, moving on to Dr. Gregory Fontana. He is the chairman of cardiothoracic surgery. He is a minimally invasive specialist. He also spends a good amount of time in the hybrid operating suite doing transcatheter work. He specializes in congenital and acquired heart disease, and he has done a good amount of investigation specific to clinical trials. Yeah. Dr. Fontana, Fontana, thanks for being with us today. Oh, thank you so much, Adam. This has been great. I really uh, enjoyed the panelists' discussions, and uh, I think you're starting to see some common themes that are weaving together today, and I'm hoping it's helpful to uh, those attending. Uh, br briefly, uh, yes, I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon. I do uh, cardiac surgery uh, specifically, uh, as well as transcatheter valve interventions. Um, one of the few surgeons that's actually trained to do both as a primary operator. And, and I, it's really 
an advantage, I think, in our institution that uh, we can have no really bias based on our specialty. We, we try to be biased towards the patient's best care and best therapy, which is a theme that uh, is is here today with us uh, during this program. I I uh, have really enjoyed over the years it, when I was in pediatrics and also adult the ev evolution of what has been mentioned as the heart team model, uh, where we tap into the the expertise and experience of all the members of the various disciplines to help create a plan together with the patient and the patient support system uh, to make sure we get the best uh, result from. Uh, the therapy that we recommend. So I, I just have a couple tips here before we get to Q&A. Um, first one is get a second opinion or a third opinion. Um, as was mentioned at the very beginning um, today by Dr. Johnson, the heart valve disease is very can, can be very confusing. I mean, a valve's function is actually quite simple. It just opens and closes and makes sure blood goes in one direction and not the other way and do, do, doing it efficiently. But there's a lot of physiology and pathology and related conditions that have been mentioned that, that make it confusing. I, I, I think one of the things that I find myself and I also see with my patients is the more information a patient can uh, be exposed to, different opinions, it actually generally makes them less stressed and more enlightened. And, and our, as the more the understanding is there, uh, the patient and the and their support system get more confidence in the therapy uh, initially and also as has been mentioned uh, in the terms of a lifetime plan. Uh, next slide. So you know I, I would like to just say that you you know a, a cardiologist and a cardiac surgeon certainly should be involved in the evaluation of every heart valve patient. Um, it may be that surgery is, has offers a dramatic advantage in some cases. And can often be do, done with a small incision. In other cases, clearly transcatheter valve uh, approaches, whether it be aortic, mitral, or now tricuspid, uh, should be done with a transcatheter approach because of the patient's comorbidities or age, for example. And there's a big gray area in the middle that, that really needs to be um, customized to the patient. And at the end of the day, uh, part of that second and third opinion should be a heart team review. Uh, if you if you don't hear that term or or it's not come up in conversations with your providers, please ask them if there's been a heart team that's sat down to review all of your studies and your history, um, and collectively have come to uh, to recommend the best treatment option for you. Next, you can see here we we have a myriad of things, and as mentioned. Uh, Small incision surgery, which has been my specialty uh, my whole career, is uh, to avoid the sternotomy. Um, as Dr. Mustafa mentioned earlier, splitting open of the chest, uh, um, which it actually we, we gently divide it, if you want to be, be honest about it. Um, and uh, But the other options are to do small incisions where the sternum's not divided at all or just very minimally and uh, leave most of the chest and tissues intact. And the recovery is actually quite prompt. So if it turns out, that surgery is recommended to you should certainly ask, is there a minimally invasive surgical option? We spend a lot of time talking about what kinds of valves. Uh, the two general categories are mechanical and, and tissue. The good thing about a mechanical valve that'll last 150 years, but the downside is you're gonna require uh, lifelong uh, anticoagulation or blood thinning. Uh, tissue valves are wonderful in that you don't you generally require um, anticoagulation, but they do have a limited uh, durability. Maybe it's 10 years, or if you're lucky, a little bit longer. And then, of course, the transcatheter valves, which have really revolutionized our approach to valvular heart disease over the last 20 years or so. Um, it was quite crude in the in the 2000s, and now the, the technology has advanced in such a way that uh, these catheters are small and they're safe, and they and they safely can deliver the new valve or the repair technology um, in a patient that uh, oftentimes is, is not under a general anesthesia and just sedated. Next slide. So finally, uh, to wrap this up, um, there's no substitute for a healthy lifestyle. Next slide. One of the things that um, I, I hear very often when patients come back and I try to plant the seed ahead of time is they'll come back and say, you know, my breathing's so much better, but I don't have energy, I don't have any stamina. And just remember that, you know, if, if you have been um, in heart failure or you've had, have been slowed down by the, the heart valve condition that you have, your body becomes deconditioned uh, significantly. And there it requires a period of reconditioning or rehabilitation. And so you can really only have the full benefit of the heart valve therapy uh, by optimizing your overall health. Exercise, everyone can do something. And whether that's chair exercises, being in a pool, 
stationary bikes, walking, um, keeping active. The one fundamental uh, that I see when my patients who are older and well, we like to call them well elderly, is that they keep moving. And once people become sedentary, uh, all kinds of consequences of, of a, a sedentary lifestyle emerge. Uh, diet and weight control, uh, certainly moderation, everything and anything in moderation. The Mediterranean diet is what we keep coming back to and all the fad diets that come around. Uh, smoking cessation, we fix, get you out of heart failure, but you continue to smoke. Uh, then you have another reason why your shortness of breath may be persistent. Stress reduction strategies, um, a, lot of, a lot of stress that occurs in medical conditions is manageable. Um, with some strategies that you should discuss with your primary care doctor. And of course, all the other health conditions that, uh, that come increasingly common as we age, hypertension, diabetes, et cetera. And then of course, regular follow-up uh, with your cardiovascular team, not just to check your blood pressure and your medicine, but to look at your overall cardiovascular health. Am I doing everything I can to optimize the therapy uh, that I've been able to have um, uh, for my heart valves? So uh, I, I think that's I think that's all I have to say today, and um, we'll move on to questions and answers. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, Dr. Fontana, thanks so much for those tips. And we are going to move on to a rapid fire question and answer session, as we have now fifty five questions um, and <laughs> only about uh, eight minutes. So. We're going to get to these questions from the patients, and if we could ask the panel to answer as succinctly as possible so we can get through as many of them as possible. The first one comes in from Nikki, and this is for you, Dr. Johnson. Has any research been conducted on stopping the calcification process of a bicuspid aortic valve? Is there a pill you can take that stops the calcification process of the valve? That's a great question, Nikki. We don't have a single medication to be able to slow the progress of the valve calcification, but we do talk about the importance of monitoring your blood pressure, decreasing how much that valve is definitely working. So if your team is recommending other therapies in relationship to overall heart health, that will also help the valve. Great, thank you, Dr. Johnson. Moving over to Natalie. Uh, Rosemary asks, I had a mitral valve replacement in December and I've been struggling with a depressed mood, isolating, etc. My PCP tells me this is an almost universal response to heart surgery. Is there any consensus as to why this happens? Thank you, Rosemary, for the question. First of all, if you notice any symptoms of depression or you feel like you're struggling, definitely talk to your medical provider. Um, but certainly discuss that with your heart team and consider um, if they can prescribe something called cardiac rehab. Um, cardiac rehab is really a great option for you because it allows you to join other patients um, in focusing on exercise and return to an active lifestyle. Other considerations would be finding out if your um, hospital has any kind of support groups. Um, we have one in our facility where they meet regularly, and that just allows you to have that camaraderie with other patients who may have similar experiences to yourself. Thanks, Natalie. I don't know if you could see me, but I was smiling ear to ear because cardi cardiac rehab was really the turning point in my recovery that took me out of cardiac depression. So thanks for those comments. Rosemary, I hope that helped you. Moving on to Dr. Ahmed. It's a question from Terry asks, if you have an ascending aorta repair and down the road you need an aortic valve replacement, can a TAVR still work pass through a repaired ascending aorta? Uh, yes, it, you can pass through an ascending aorta. You need to kind of look at the aorta before and after and make sure it doesn't need any further work doing itself. But a graft itself doesn't doesn't prevent that. Assuming the valve is tight, sometimes when the aorta is repaired, it's a leaky valve associated with that. And a TAVA for a leaky valve like that may, may not be the best option. But the specific answer to the question is, yes, you can pass a TAVA through a repaired ascending aorta. Great. Thanks, Dr. Ahmed. Moving over to Dr. Fontana, and this is all about a big problem in our community, which is AFib. Bruce asks, is it normal for patients to take Coumadin before and after open heart valve surgery due to AFib? Does the patient need to take that blood thinner for the rest of their life, even if AFib is gone? That's a great question, uh, Bruce. Thank you for that. Uh, the atrial fibrillation remains, a, as uh, Adam says, a huge problem in this country, and it is often associated with valve disease. If you have open heart surgery, the surgeon should be addressing the atrial fibrillation and in two ways. One is potentially doing an ablation to eliminate the rhythm, 
But most importantly, related to the blood thinner, is the removal of the left atrial appendage, this cul-de-sac that's on the attached to the left atrium that just fibrillates and, and quivers. And that's where uh, blood clots, clots can form. And that's why we take blood thinners, because that can be associated with stroke. And um, if the surgeon removes or clips the left atrial appendage during the open uh, heart valve surgery, um, that risk is dramatically reduced. Uh, that said, you should work with your cardiologist towards uh, uh, discontinuation of anticoagulation. Uh, these days, we've moved from Coumadin to some novel anticoagulants that aren't quite as difficult to manage. And uh, But the answer, in, in short, is there is a potential to discontinue blood thinners after uh, the open heart surgery. Great. Thank you. Back over to Dr. Johnson. Irene asks, I have mild, moderate tricuspid valve regurgitation. Is it serious? Should I see a cardiologist? Great question, Irene. And yes, it is a great time to see a cardiologist. It's not at a severe stage. Remember, we're saying don't wait. Don't wait for symptoms. Don't wait as far as it becoming severe. You'll be able to walk through what it means as far as how often it's monitored. And as also Dr. Fontana highlighted the importance of a heart healthy lifestyle to really slow the progression. Great. Thanks, Dr. Johnson. A big question for you, Natalie, comes in from me. And the question is, what is the biggest challenge or frustration that patients experience leading up to treatment? And how can you help them overcome that challenge or frustration? This is a big question. Um, I think that the biggest frustration for patients is the new diagnosis. Um, whenever the valve disease progresses to that severe range because now it's really impacting their quality of life. And so patients, now you're being told you have heart valve disease, you're going to be shuffled through all the disappointments, the testing, uh, workup, all while being told, and you get to look forward to making a choice about what operation that you're going to need to fix the issue. Um, as a valve program coordinator, I, I do get to educate patients um, about their heart disease. I navigate them through the testing and the workup process. And I also empower patients to have a voice in their treatment plan. And when I call my patients specifically um, for that first time, I make sure that they know my name and how to get in touch with me. And I think that the role of the program coordinator is pivotal to, to patients um, and being dedicated to my patients and my hospital helps them overcome frustrations. Um, having that central point of contact in your valve program coordinator. I love hearing that you are the intersect and the interface for the patients and the clinical work that's needed. Thank you for that, Natalie. And over to Dr. Ahmed, John asks, what are the primary risks involved with TAVR? What percent of TAVR patients have moderate to severe complications? And how does your team manage those complications? Oh, let me try and give a simple answer to a, a actually complex question. So TAVR itself overall is safe procedure. The risk depends on the risk of the person going in. If we take a low-risk person that's otherwise healthy and do a TAVR on them, there's uh, the risk of the procedure itself should be, um, you know, you should have a 99% chance of surviving that procedure and, and doing well. The risk of a pacemaker should be less than 7%. The risk of a leak around the valve should be less than 2 to 3%. That's a significant leak. The risk of stroke which is, in my opinion, the most feared complication of these procedures, should be less than 1% to 2%. Um, and, of course, as you take sicker and sicker or older and more complex patients, then the risk of those can increase. The risk does decrease depending on experience of the team, depending on number of valves done over time. And um, quality mechanisms are in place for most places. And these are questions which, again, the kind of figures I've quoted are okay. There are places with better outcomes than that. There are places with worse outcomes than that. And these questions should be asked of anyone wanting to get these valves done or any any operation or anything ever done is, what is the local experience? What is the risk? Can we actually have, can we see some of that data? Not just, hey, we do it great. By the way, it works well and we're wonderful. No, it needs to be, what is your published or what is your uh, documented risks of that. And, and that's what I would ask if I went to a place. And lots of people have asked in the question, how do we choose where to go? Lots of really, really good valve centers uh, exist. But these are the basic questions to ask is, um, what are your complications? How do they compare to the average centers? And how do they, what is your experience doing this? Because all of that's related to it. Great, John, I hope that helped you. I know it helped me. And Dr. Fontana, 
everybody is always thinking about uh, what is the future of valve therapy and loyal asks for aortic valve uh, replacement, what new technologies will be available in the next 15 to 20 years? For example, will we be able to grow a new valve tissue in the lab and have it installed? Well, thanks, Loyal. Now, this is my uh, this is my favorite part of what we do is is um, is making advances with technologies and putting them into clinical trials to to prove we have a better uh, a better therapy. I'll tell you, I've been doing this for thirty years, and we've been talking about growing leaflets uh, using our own tissue uh, my entire career. It really is the holy grail to be able to have a tissue solution that doesn't require any blood thinning and also is is durable as long as, as we need it with one therapy. Um, I think the most likely next um, leaflet and valve technology to come out will probably be polymers, or there's even some work with nanometals that, that are just, you know, can last forever. They can, they can uh, they're so durable uh, that they can last for decades. And uh, there's a lot of work being done in labs uh, right now. I think we'll probably see that before growing our own tissue. There's been a number of um, technologies now where we take Part of the patient's tissue, for example, the sac around the heart, the pericardium, and at, at the table, uh, build a valve uh, with your own tissue. So far, those haven't uh, shown to be as durable as, as the valves that are uh, artificially um, constructed from either animal tissue or from, uh, from metals. But I am sure that uh, we are going to see things in the next 15 to 20 years that we have never even thought of yet. That certainly has been the case in the past, um, but uh, stay tuned. Yeah. Well, thank you for that comment, for those comments, Dr. Fontana. And I want to respect everybody's time. We're coming close to the, well, actually, we are at the end of the webinar, but please don't uh, disconnect just yet as we have some closing remarks. We didn't get to some of these questions, but one of the central themes of coming out of everybody today, the physicians, Natalie, myself, is this idea of empowerment. And really, if you think about where empowerment, how it looks, it looks a lot of times like the smiling faces on all of these patients that you see here as part of a national campaign that is being launched and managed by Medtronic. It's called Silence is Not Golden, Life Is. And we've already talked today about the undertreatment and why, if you have a problem, listen to your body, like Dr. Johnson said, look at your symptoms, be open-minded, go and get opinions so that you can have a great outcome specific to your valve therapy. And at this new website, lifeisgoldenwithevolutetaver.com, uh, we went ahead and we asked patients, what's been your golden opportunity since being treated with TAVR, and it, it is a fascinating inquiry to see how patients are returning to active living after having a valve therapy. It might be even just more empowering and educational for you. And lastly, uh, we are having a heart valve day giveaway that is going on right now. Everybody who was on this webinar is automatically registered in it, and the winner's uh, announcements are going to be happening tomorrow. So uh, we got a lot of great heartvalvesurgery.com goodies to give away. And as we wrap up, I want to very quickly thank our expert panel, Dr. Johnson, Natalie Kelly, uh, Dr. Mustafa Med, and Dr. Gregory Fontana for being with me today. I really want to thank you, the patients in our community, for coming together and really being a part and being advocates for advocates for all of our own healthcare and valve therapies to live the best quality of life that we can. And I'd like to thank you now for in advance for doing the survey. On behalf of everybody, we hope you had a great National Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day. And yes, thanks to Medtronic, our sponsor. And with that, I wish you all the best. And we will be talking to you soon. As we always see, say here at heartvalvesurgery.com, keep on ticking. Hi, everybody. It's Adam. I hope you enjoyed that video. And don't forget, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel, watch the next two educational videos coming up on your screen, or click the blue button to visit heartvalvesurgery.com.